We're, uh, we're really delighted tonight uh, to have a, a friend uh, return to us. Uh, Brant Rosen first came uh, to Fort Wayne in May of 2014, and uh, this is his third time back uh, among us. Uh, Brant is uh, uh, the spiritual leader of Sedek uh, uh, Chicago. It's a Jewish spiritual community, non-Zionist, justice-based, uh, working for uh, justice and human rights, not only in the Chicagoland area, but uh, in the U.S. and throughout the world. He's the former, uh, a former congregational rabbi in Evanston, and then he was the Midwest Regional Director of the American Friends Service Committee, the Quakers, uh, based in Chicago for five years. Uh, Brant's also the uh, uh, co-founder of the Jewish Voice for Peace Rabbinical Council and been very active uh, in Jewish Voice for Peace for a number of years now. Uh, so those are some of the, 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 some of the data. But really, uh, this man walks, walks his talk. And he's a model, really, for uh, humility and courage, which is a rare combination in, in, a, in a leader. And we're really, really delighted to have uh, Brant Rosen here uh, to speak with us tonight. So, Brant, welcome to Fort Wayne uh, again, and welcome to Plymouth Church and in Indiana uh, Center for Middle East Peace. Well, thank you, Michael, for that very gracious introduction, uh, and for all the good, hard, sacred work you do with the Indiana Center. Uh, I know this program was um, put together uh, fairly quickly in the scheme of things, and so I want to thank Michael for helping to organize it, and also all of you for, uh, for your attendance here and for being here tonight. Uh, I also want to express my gratitude to Plymouth Church for hosting. Um, I don't take for granted whenever we have programs on this particular subject, uh, we should never take for granted. Uh, that houses of worship will uh, have the presence of mind and the open-hearted spirit to be able to allow ideas such as these that will be the converse kinds of conversation we'll be having tonight, uh, standing in solidarity with Palestinians, uh, is not a popular thing in this country. So I don't take for granted when houses of worship open their doors for this kind of a program. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Ron and Janie Caldwell for being my very gracious hosts. Uh, once again, uh, it's always a pleasure to visit Fort Wayne. I really consider uh, all of you to be friends as well and really comrades and colleagues in this movement that we're a part of. So again, I'm, I'm delighted to be here and thank you for coming this evening. Uh, Michael asked me to talk about the state of affairs uh, politically in Israel-Palestine and in the movement for a just peace in Israel-Palestine, um, some of the challenges that we're facing, how we can uh, be a part of it, particularly at this moment in time, this political moment in time, which is uh, in many ways quite surreal uh, and, and in many ways rather unprecedented. Um, how do we find our place uh, in this movement? Uh, and, and specifically, I think, um, Michael asked, uh, for folks doing this work in a, in a state like Indiana and in a part of Indiana like Fort Wayne, I'm sure it can feel very isolating. Um, so uh, how you can be part of this movement in an, in an active way, I have some thoughts about that, but I would love this to be a conversation. And that's the final thing I wanna say before I begin is I'll try to keep my words to about 20 minutes or so. I'm not always that successful at holding to my deadline. Um, but I'll try to really just make my remarks to you to be some introductory suggestions based on my own perspective of uh, where we are right now and then really open it up for question and answer and conversation to talk about any of these things that, I've, that I identify or other issues that are important to you. I'm, I'm most interested in having the conversation that's most interesting to you. So, <clears throat> Uh, what is going on in Israel-Palestine? I think in many ways it's, it's very, very dire. I won't sugarcoat it on, on so many levels. Uh, when you read the news, anyone who reads the news even in a cursory way 
uh, can see that uh, things are going from bad to worse. Uh, in the occupied territories, you know, we are now maybe a month away from uh, the, the US administration's so-called peace plan uh, for uh, Israel-Palestine. It really is not a peace plan in any sense of the word. It's really a, uh, an ultimatum that's being imposed on the parties. Uh, it was done without any Palestinian consultation whatsoever and probably most alarming, but not unexpected. Uh, it really is a license to annex major parts of the West Bank uh, to give Israel uh, a green light to annex parts of the Jordan Valley uh, and uh, other settlement blocks that they've long been coveting to uh, be, as they would consider it, part of Israel proper. Uh, there are many people who are saying that this is the death knell for the two-state solution. Um, I'm one of those people. There may well be people in this room who have long been saying that, that that death knell has been ringing for some time now. Uh, but this is yet one more nail in that coffin. Uh, I, I think the fact that we haven't heard a whole lot about the peace plan since it was unveiled is not surprising. I don't think we're going to hear much more about it. Uh, I think it's really just uh, kind of a fig leaf for the administration to give Israel uh, carte blanche to, to do um, what it likes. I think we have an unprecedented green light from, U green light from a U.S. administration. And that's saying a lot uh, because the, the U.S., even though uh, a two-state solution has been the official goal of this administration, uh, uh, for past administrations, uh, and coming to some kind of negotiated settlement, uh, Israel has been settling the West Bank with impunity long before this particular moment. So this is only really um, giving political cover for something that's been existing for, for a very, very long time. I think um, one thing that we should point out is that Israel has just finished its third election in less than a year, and the results have pretty much been the same as previous elections. Uh, these elections have been forced because of the parliamentary uh, system in Israel and the fact that, uh, that the Prime Minister Netanyahu has been just enmeshed in so many political domestic crises that are forcing new elections. And uh, each time, the, the the uh, result is, is more or less the same. He, come, he gets the plurality of votes, but not enough to be able to form a coalition. And I think at last count, he was able to find 58 uh, seats to form a government uh, coalition, but you need over 60, it's 61 at, at minimum. And it seems to have stalled at 58. Uh, Israel is really split down that, that line between uh, the Likud uh, nationalists, and then a mix of uh, Haredi religious uh, parties, uh, uh, Israeli left, which is almost non-existent at this point. One of, if there is a bright light, I think, in the election is that the Arab list, there's a joint list of uh, uh, parties that were put together by Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel that did better in this election than uh, in any previous elections. Uh, and I, they could not have done that without support from the Israeli left. Uh, so that, will, it's not clear what that will mean politically, uh, but it does mean that the struggle from within the political system in, in Israel has not, has, uh, is not completely over. Uh, and I, I don't have much more to say other than that it's a very interesting and hopeful development and it's one that's worth keeping our eye, eye on in, um, in coming months and uh, throughout the year. I will also say we, when we're talking about the, the occupied territories, we have to mention Gaza. Uh, Gaza is a part of uh, the Israel-Palestine conflict that is particularly uh, close to my heart. I visited Gaza a little over a year ago when I was working at uh, American Friends Service Committee who has a uh, has staff people in program, a program in, in Gaza. I was able to see firsthand some of the effects of the crushing blockade that has, uh, Israel has imposed on 
the Gaza Strip and the people of Gaza for well over 10 years now. Uh, 2020 is a bit of a milestone year because, as some of you may know, 2020 was the year that the UN uh, designated as the year by which uh, Gaza would be uh, officially unlivable. Uh, when that pronouncement came out a few years ago, I think there were many who said that that's a very subjective benchmark and that by many standards we can consider Gaza unlivable now and has been for some time. Uh, there uh, is uh, a, uh, a, a massive dearth of potable drinking water because of uh, pollution to uh, the desalination plants and the purification plants that were destroyed during Israel's military onslaughts. Uh, Palestinians are not able to uh, gain a living through fishing. They have no freedom of movement whatsoever, so people who need serious medical treatment are basically trapped inside Gaza with very, very few exceptions. Uh, a little over a year ago, as Michael mentioned, the uh, Great March of Return began, which was a protest, a nonviolent protest, uh, along the border uh, that took place every week uh, that was uh, really generated uh, on a grassroots level. <coughs> and has been going ever since, although the, the media is not <clears throat> has not been covering it. Uh, the media hasn't also been covering Israel, the Israeli military's crushing response to it, uh, which is almost on a weekly basis as Palestinians line up along the border fence uh, that will, uh, the Israeli military will fire live ammunition directly at the protesters, and there have been hundreds of deaths and many, many more maimed. Uh, including uh, women and children. Um, Gaza <clears throat> is, in many ways, I consider Gaza to be ground zero of this, of this conflict. Uh, it is predominantly a refugee population. Uh, most of the people who live in Gaza were, belong to families that are not originally from that area. Uh, 75 to 80% of Gazans are, uh, come from refugee families that uh, were uh, lo lived in uh, parts uh, of historic Palestine uh, in the middle and, and southern regions of the country. Uh, and after the Nakba in 48 and 49 ended up in Gaza with full expectation that they'd be able to return their home when hostilities ended, uh, it's now 2020, uh, and there's nearly 2 million people in that very tiny strip of land. The other thing I want to flag, I think for those of us who are in the solidarity movement who have been doing this work uh, from the United States, one of the most important mechanisms we have to show solidarity and to participate in this movement is through the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. I'm sure all of are you fam are familiar with this. Uh, the Palestinian civil society call for nonviolent resistance through boycott, divestment, uh, and sanctions against Israel and companies that profit from the occupation. Uh, the response to BDS from the Israeli government and from advocates of Israel uh, has been absolutely fierce. Uh, the, there is a government ministry now that is, uh, has been dedicated to uh, fighting, specific, fighting against BDS specifically. Hundreds of millions of dollars, I'm not exaggerating, are, uh, are on, on an annual basis are devoted to fighting BDS on a number of different levels. There are organizations uh, such as Stand With Us uh, that are founded to uh, specifically combat BDS uh, on college campuses uh, and to clamp down on students uh, who are participating in these campaigns on their in their schools. And in the past year, year plus, we've seen a very uh, um, what's the word, ominous uh, and troubling turn, and that is the criminalization of BDS. In other words, uh, it is now in uh, many states uh, considered to be a crime to participate in the BDS movement. Uh, there are many uh, states that require uh, public employees to sign pledges before they are hired, that they will never boycott Israel, uh, to, to, to promise that they have never uh, boycotted Israel and will never boycott Israel. Um, and there uh, are, we are seeing a criminalization of companies <coughs> that, uh, and public institutions 
that to some extent or another will not work with contractors that, uh, that are profiting from the occupation. Um, we are seeing this happen across the country uh, and what's even more ominous is that in many instances uh, the, the, these laws, these legislation are defining BDS specifically as a form of anti-Semitism. And relatively recently, uh, in December, uh, Donald Trump signed an executive order that suggested this, just that using a, a definition of, uh, of anti-Semitism that includes, that is so vaguely worded uh, that it could well include not only boycott of, of Israel and those who profit from uh, the occupation, but criticism of Israel in general is now uh, being defined as anti-Semitic and can be uh, potentially punishable by law, which is this is what it's come to. Uh, it is a, what I like to say about this backlash, and there's much more, there are so many levels of backlash that I can talk about. Um, I often say that the ferocity of this backlash is absolutely a sign that BDS is working. Uh, Israel would not care about this movement, they would not be paying attention to this movement, and they certainly would not be dedicating hundreds of millions of dollars to fighting this movement if they were not scared by it, if they didn't believe it actually had a potential to leverage people power <coughs> against state power, which is what boycotts uh, are designed to do. So it's a two-sided coin. Um, yes, we need to take this backlash very, very seriously, but we also need to understand that it is a, a, sign, a very important sign of the success of the movement, that the, the backlash is as, uh, as ferocious as it is. And with that, I want to talk now uh, about some of the hopeful signs, because it's not all dire. Uh, in fact, I think, I, well, I don't think we should be sanguine about all of the things and more that I didn't talk about. Uh, that are uh, very, very serious and that we need to take very, very seriously uh, as for those who stand in solidarity with Palestinians. Um, there are signs that there is a paradigm shift going on, that there, we are in the middle of perhaps some kind of tipping point in terms of uh, Israel's impunity in, uh, in the international stage and in, in this country specifically. And I just want to give you a few examples of that that I think are very important. One is on the legislative front. Uh, we now live in an era in which we have legislation that is, uh, was on the H.R. 1407, which was uh, a House resolution that was introduced by, Senator, uh, the, by Representative Betty McCollum of Minnesota. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Uh, it is a bill that focuses specifically on Palestinian human rights, which is unprecedented. It's the second time it's been introduced. Uh, it has, I think, at present, between 20 and 30 uh, co-signers. Uh, and it, what's important about it is that it is asking uh, the State Department to investigate the Israeli military's detention and imprisonment and maltreatment of Palestinian minors. Israel is the only country in the world that militarily imprisons children. Uh, and this particular version of the bill actually invokes the Leahy Law, which means if it determines that there are human rights abuses taking place that we withhold aid, that would go toward um, th that aspect of the military occupation, which is the, whole, the concept of the United States withholding aid has been uh, a political third rail that has just been a non-starter for, for many, many years. The fact that there is a representative that has introduced this bill on the floor and that it is it has co-signers to it, I think is very, very important. Um, relatively recently on the legislative front, there is uh, another development that I think we need to pay attention to, and this has to do with going back to Gaza. Uh, Representatives Mark Pocan of uh, Wisconsin and uh, Debbie Dingell of, uh, of uh, Michigan introduced a Dear Colleague letter that is calling for uh, the end of the blockade to Gaza. And it was co-signed by 70 congresspeople. Uh, 
that's important. <laughs> I think it's almost, un it's really unprecedented. Um, and I would encourage you, even though you live in a red state, although, I don't know, it might be a little purplish. It, you did go for Obama in 08, I'm just saying. <laughs> um, but I'll leave that to you. You know more about your state politics than I do. Um, I would encourage you, even uh, if you feel like your representatives, that it's a complete non-starter with your representatives, it still is enormously important that they hear from constituents who want them, that they know there are constituents who want them to sign on to these letters and legislations, uh, and to organize to get others to do it. <clears throat> they pay attention to that. Um, it's, it's very, very important that across the board, no matter what is the political reality in the communities in which we live, that when these politicians go out on a limb, and believe me, people like Mark Pocan and Betty McCollum, they get hate mail that you would not even begin to imagine. Uh, uh, it's very important that they know that there are people who have their back. And um, both to write letters to them to thank them, even if they're not your representatives, and to encourage uh, or demand from your representatives that they sign on as well. Another area <clears throat> in which uh, I think we're seeing some hopeful and really unprecedented signs is um, uh, regarding the Israel lobby, uh, APAC in particular, uh, which has historically been seen as just this, this behemoth juggernaut that just can, cannot be stopped. Uh, and in fact, APAC is, is hitting on hard times right now. And I said this just recently um, to a friend. I, I really, and I'm not, this is not hyperbole, I never thought I would ever live to see the day in which a sitting congresswoman uh, called APAC a racist organization. Uh, that was Betty McCollum, because, because of the bill that she, uh, the No Way to Treat a Child bill, APAC, uh, took out publicity that said she was uh, a terrorist that was worse than ISIS. And she, she's pretty fearless. She just fought right back and said, this is racist garbage. And um, shortly after that, we learned that Bernie Sanders would not be attending the APAC convention, and he specifically said the reason why. That's not unprecedented for politicians not to go to APAC, but often they'll say, well, we had scheduling problems, or uh, they won't really say why they're doing it, or um, they'll not go, but they'll offer some kind of video uh, welcome or message. Uh, Bernie Sanders said um, that he's not going because it's a bigoted organization, and he doesn't want to have anything to do with them. Um, APAC is also, it's very well known that APAC is funding efforts that are uh, um, just directing a great deal of hate ad, ads against Sanders and his campaign. I don't know why anyone in his position would want to go there, but to publicly fight back and call them a bigoted organization, I just, for a presidential candidate to say that about APAC is kind of amazing. Uh, after that happened, we learned that Elizabeth Warren and uh, Amy Klobuchar and Pete Buttigieg uh, also said they would not be going. They didn't go as far as Sanders did, and I think Klobuchar and Buttigieg did send some kind of video welcome uh, that was sort of, you know, kind of milk toast. Uh, Mike Bloomberg was the only one who actually, only uh, candidate who actually went. Um, I think APAC, the, the armor is starting to seriously crack with APAC, and I think that's something we need to take seriously and strategize around. Um, another important part of the Israel lobby is the Christian Zionists, and in particular, the organization that represents many Christian Zionists is KUFI, Christians United for Israel. Um, last year uh, at their convention, there was a very significant movement of, uh, of, of resistance and civil disobedience at the convention. You may have seen this on, uh, on the news or on social media. Uh, there were people dragged out of the convention hall. There were banner drops. There were people who chained themselves to the front. And this was an interfaith coalition of folks uh, Christians like uh, uh, members of Sib FOSNA, Friends of uh, Seville, North America, but also members of Jewish Voice for Peace, and If Not Now, which are Jewish organizations, and other people of faith and conscience. Uh, and uh, I think KUFI has, is in many ways probably one of the most powerful Zionist lobbies and in, in advocacy organizations in the world. Uh, 
in terms of its budget and its membership. And um, they've been sort of flying under the radar, but they're, um, they can't fly under the radar anymore. Um, we have a vice president who is a, is a Christian Zionist. We have a secretary of state who is an avowed Christian Zionist, both of whom adhere to uh, end of days theology that is uh, part of the Christian Zionist ideology. Uh, we need to take that very seriously, and I think we're beginning to. So I will mention, if any of you are interested, and this is anticipating the what can I do question, uh, the next Kufai convention is coming up in June, um, and I know, because I've talked to many of them, there are preparations being made for even a larger counter demonstration at this year's uh, conference. Uh, so if any of you are interested in chaining yourselves to the doors or being dragged screaming out of the convention hall, I can tell you who to contact. <laughs> um, uh, it's going to be Washington, D.C. Um, so all of these things are really signs that um, the movement, the solidarity movement, is vigorous. Um, oh, I should, I should mention one more thing, actually. Um, I mentioned the legislative uh, criminalization of, of BDS uh, uh, activism. There have been successes. The pushback to this legislation has begun. And you may have read that in three states so far, federal courts in Arizona, Kansas, and Texas have struck down those laws. Um, and there is a coalition of, uh, in the legal community made up with the ACLU and Palestine Legal and Center for Constitutional Rights and others uh, that are on the front lines of this fight who are working. It's, it's almost like playing whack-a-mole because every day we read about new legislation uh, that is coming up, but they have already started to succeed in turning back some of that legislation. Um, that is something else that we can participate in, both learning about uh, the legislation in our states and, and states around the country, learn about the efforts that are going on to combat them in ways that citizens can add their voices to it through, through petitions uh, or organizing on the ground. Uh, the fact that uh, the put that that the the counterattack to, uh, to this legislation has been so successful so early is very hopeful. It is patently unconstitutional. <laughs> I mean, just on its face. Of course, that doesn't mean all that much anymore. <laughs> but um, it's important that we see that there, uh, again, there's a chink in this armor as well that we should take seriously. I should also mention one of the longest battles on this front was also uh, victorious, and some of you may have followed the Olympia Food Co-op. Anybody here familiar with the Olympia Food Co-op fight? Olympia is actually a small but mighty uh, lo uh, focus of Israel-Palestine uh, uh, activism and Palestine solidarity. And this was over 10 years ago now. The Olympia Food Co-op was one of the very first institutions, I don't know if you could call it co-op an institution, but Olympia Washington, Olympia Washington right. Um, uh, that said they would not stock any products uh, that were made in Israel. Uh, and they were hit hard with a slap suit that was signed by various Isra Israel advocacy organizations uh, that they have been fighting for 10 years. Uh, and it, it has been a long, hard struggle. And uh, just this last week, uh, a, it went, went all the way up to the state Supreme Court uh, they struck, they ruled in favor of the food co-op in Olympia, Washington. Uh, and so there is great uh, joy in Olympia right now, um, but it's a sign that the road may be long, if I can indulge that cliche, but victory is possible. And so it's, it's important to know that when things just feel so dire, and the litany of things that I mentioned at the beginning just feel so overwhelming, to know that there is a vigorous movement of solidarity that is fighting back hard and, and, um, and chalking up many important victories. And there's every reason to believe that we will continue to do so. So I'll just finish with the question of what can we do? And I already mentioned a few things. Um, I, I, I think it's a mistake to think that because your, representative, your political representatives in this state uh, are implacably uh, uh, in, in favor of everything the Israeli government does, um, that, there's, that there's nothing you can do. As I mentioned before, they need, if they represent you, then they need to know how you feel. 
And if you have friends in your community and people you know and colleagues and comrades in your community who you feel the same way, it's important to organize um, and to ask them, have you signed on to HR uh, 1407? Have you signed on to uh, the friend, the dear colleague letter that Pocan and Dingle put out? And if not, why not? Uh, and hold them accountable. Uh, if possible, to visit them in person uh, and visit their staff in person. Um, it, it, is, it is enormously important that our representatives hear from us, even if we know that, uh, that in many cases they are not going to be swayed. Um, that's how our system works, and it's important that we participate in it. So I, I don't want to encourage the, um, the fatigue, the very justified fatigue that I think we often feel when we feel like we're banging head against a brick wall when we try to engage our political representatives. Uh, these things also happen on a city level. You know, there are BDS uh, campaigns that are going on locally in city councils around the country, and it's important to learn about them and to see what's happening either in your community or in surrounding communities. Um, BDS is designed for citizens to participate in a very active way. Um, and if you go to the, uh, <clears throat> there are many websites, but the BDS National uh, Committee has a list of all of the various campaigns, or Jewish Voice for Peace has as well, all the various campaigns that are going on around the country. You can find ways to participate there as well. So I think really the, 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 to the question of what can we do, I think the question is, as ever, organizing, um, creating relationships with people who share your convictions. And this is not just on this issue, but it's many other issues that are not disconnected from the issue of Israel-Palestine. Uh, and also, and I, maybe I'll end here, when it comes to solidarity, it's not only about the big statements and uh, the affiliations with organizations, but it's also about the interpersonal relationships that we have. And I may well be, I'm probably speaking to the choir on this one, but I'll just say it anyways, because I, I fervently believe this is so important, which is you know, any organizer who knows anything about organizing will tell you that the first order of business when you go to a community to organize it is that you meet the people in it and you cultivate relationships with them and you engage in what are called one-on-ones, which is literally calling someone up or emailing them or reaching them somehow and saying, um, you're someone I'd like to get to know and go out for coffee uh, and get to know each other and to tell you, share your story with each other and why you're invested in this issue, trade contact info, uh, and you build those relationships step by step so that when it's time to mobilize, but not even mobilize, when it's time to show solidarity. You know, I have many, I consider to be friends uh, in the Chicago community, in the Muslim community, for instance. Uh, and when I hear about an act of Islamophobia, whether it's a shooting at a mosque or some kind of desecration or some kind of harassment, I make a point of reaching out to my Muslim friends and let them know that they're in my thoughts and I stand with them. And those kinds of things are enormously meaningful. Um, they're also meaningful to me when they reciprocate, when there are acts of anti-Semitism, which are certainly on the rise, whether they're shootings at synagogues or stabbings in New York or what have you. Um, I was overwhelmed by my, uh, the, the emails and calls that I got from friends who uh, said, I'm thinking of you. It, it makes a difference. And um, there can be no substitute for simple, basic relationship when you're, when you're in the work of solidarity. So I'm sure many of you already have these kinds of relationships. And um, I can only say that we need to continue broadening them. Uh, that's the only way we're going to win. Uh, and winning, and we had a little conversation about this uh, over dinner, which is do revolutions work? You know, um, I think history shows that we have victories and we have setbacks. But the victories are significant. And the victories that happen after the previous victories are the ones that occur because the people who experienced the setback didn't allow themselves to be cowed by it or discouraged by it or feel like there's nothing they can do. And, you know, if you are inspired by people who took a stand throughout history, um, people who devoted their lives to combating racism and oppression and fascism, uh, if you are inspired by those people, then you need to know that 
none of those people had the odds on their side. None of them. Uh, and we need to know that there will be times where we won't win. And we may not win in the end. I mean, I think it's important to say that out loud. You know, I often say when talking about any issue that I do believe we have history on our side, but I'm not sure we have time on our side. And uh, I really, I think it's important to be honest about that, to be honest about the daunting odds that we're facing. Uh, and then once we have done that, I think we need to say what, when, the, when our end comes, how do we want, what, where do we want to be when, what do we want to be able to say when that time comes? And I think for most of us is we did everything we could. Um, and we created community and we created solidarity and we found joy in that struggle. Um, that is, uh, I think, so important when we're asked what can we do. I think it is finding ways to give each other strength and replenish one another so that we can keep the struggle going no matter what. Um, I think sometimes it's a, it's a mistake to define a success as victory. Um, I think success is in the communities that we build and the, the victories that we experience along the road. Um, so that is my, um, my message and my encouragement to uh, continue to do this work for all those of you uh, who are actively involved in this work. Um, all of us are called to take on issues um, for all kinds of intangible reasons. There are certain issues that just keep us up nights and it's not always, we're not always sure why it's one issue and not the other. Um, but they're all interrelated and um, we need to find a way together to, to make these connections to build the communities and the movement that will keep us going uh, toward a future of justice. So I will end there and I think I did pretty well. <laughs> a little over 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, there's obviously much more to say this all.